Did the Heat break the Philadelphia 76ers? And was Jimmy Butler on his way to Philly to reunite with former teammate Joel Embiid? We break down the latest news out of Miami and around the league on today's episode of Locked on Heat. You are Locked on Heat, your daily Miami Heat podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome to Locked On Heat, your daily podcast on the Miami Heat. Whether you're tuning in on YouTube or your favorite podcast app, thanks for making Locked On Heat your first listen every day. I'm Wes Goldberg, editor at AllYouCanHeat.com, here with David Ramil. Both of us are credentialed Heat media members who cover this team every day. Got a fun show for you today on a Friday, talking about how the Heat caused drama in Philadelphia, and we'll get to some of the all-star game changes and look ahead to Heat Mavs on Sunday here in a second. But first, today's episode is brought to you by Robinhood. Robinhood Gold provides the privileges of a high net worth for any net worth. These generous benefits are now available for only $5 a month. The new gold standard is here with Robinhood Gold. Sign up at Robinhood.com slash gold. Also a reminder that your favorite podcast now has a newsletter. Introducing the Locked on Heat daily newsletter. One stop for ultimate team and league coverage delivered right to your inbox. Sign up for free now at LockedOnDaily.com. That's LockedOnDaily.com and start your day with the all new free Locked on Heat newsletter. So David, we haven't had a chance to really get into the 76ers team meeting that they had after that loss in Miami on Monday night. You've got Tyrese Maxey calling out Joel Embiid for not being on time and various other things. You've got Embiid going to the media and saying whoever leaked the intel of this meeting is a piece of bleep. you got Paul George talking about it on his podcast. Um, David, the Heat have had the Sixers number for years. Yeah. They finally broke them. They <laughs> broke them on Monday. They broke the 76ers. The team that had been... Anti-tank, anti-process, respect the basketball gods in the Miami Heat forever. Ended the process. And I don't know if that's symbolic. I don't know if the basketball gods are smiling upon the Miami Heat at this moment here, but it sure does feel like it, doesn't it? I, yeah, I kind of love it, to be honest with you. I, I mean, we've talked about it before. I, I, look, the, the process, it was a good system, and I understand that. But I, I just can't help but gravitate more towards Miami's approach of always trying your best and trying to find ways to win. And, and I, you know, we've talked about tanking with this team and a lot of fans might even say, you know what, this season's not going anywhere. This is going to be a mid team. You know, I understand that approach, but I also don't think, I think there's a, a, a comfortable medium or a balance between the two rather than having to just blow up everything and put your fans through the absolute misery that they went through over a period of years only to just get nothing out of it. Like they haven't even been able to advance deep in the playoffs. Miami's had more playoff success than that team has. So, uh, you know, as far as the, the breaking is concerned, I'd also love to attribute that to Miami and them beating them on Monday night. Mm -hmm. But I think that team has been broken for a while. And I think it's always going to be broken mm -hmm. whenever you have Jordan beat on the roster and trying to incorporate an injured player like Paul George. I remember us talking about, had Miami somehow found a way to trade Jimmy Butler or had they needed to trade Jimmy Butler over the offseason, could they pivot and try to acquire Paul George? That seems like a losing possibility there. Like George is just not the player he once was. And while he's capable of some great things on occasion, that just hasn't looked to be the case now. So they I mean, are early as last year. Yeah. Like you said once was. I mean, this was months ago. Like once was was months ago. And I don't yeah, know what's good. going on in Philly, but I, I do agree with you where I don't know. Is, is it the infrastructure? Is it the leadership? Whether and, and when we're talking about leadership, are we talking about the head coach, Daryl Morey, Joel Embiid mm. himself, right? Mm. Where yeah. And look, it, it has largely been a small sample. I don't think Paul George is as bad as he's been this year, right? He's not like a sub 40% shooter. Like he's going to get, he's going to be better, right? Like he has to be a little Maybe. bit better, right? Maybe. Maybe. But I, I, I agree with you though. Like there's something with that Philadelphia thing where you go there and it just doesn't really work and 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 i it's hard to attribute to it put your finger on any one thing but maybe it is just going back to the very beginnings of this thing with the process where you kind of bred a culture of losing and yeah. i i look you've you've completely changed over the front office twice since the yeah. process began um the head coaching staff has been changed over twice since the process began I don't know how true it is that like, can a new coach come in? Can a new leadership come in and instill a new culture like Pat Riley did when, when he came to Miami or several other, you know, coaches around the league have when, when they entered their teams and, and got them to win. I don't, I don't know. And that's why I keep kind of going back to like, well, what's the one constant? It's been Joel Embiid this entire time. Yep. 
and he's got this sort of like, woe is me, nobody's ever fair to me kind of thing that's really annoying because I honestly think that the media has been largely friendly to Joel Embiid. Like, if he thinks he gets hated on, like, Im- like imagine what he like what LeBron went through when he came to Miami, what oh. Kevin Durant has been through through his entire career. Like, the, the vitriol yeah. and the hatred for those guys is so much more intense than what it is for Joel Embiid. Oh, yeah. Joel Embiid has been dominant at times, at times the best player in the world. Like, he can he has reached those levels, a former MVP. But he's also kind of been like a sideshow with the Shirley Temples and like, oh, what what would it be like if he was healthy in the playoffs and like all these unfortunate injuries? Like he hasn't gotten the stuff that James Harden has gotten for his playoff failures. Mm -hmm. And I believe Mm -hmm. that he shouldn't, right? Like he's actually gotten some bad luck with injuries. Like that is for sure for Embiid. But this, like there was a thing about like the other day he was talking to the media and I got, and he kind of like rolls his eyes and I'm like, I guess it's all my fault. After the Memphis game, he scores 30. I guess it's all my fault again. And it's like, dude, like, where's the accountability? Like, maybe it isn't your fault. Yeah, you had 30 points tonight. Maybe, and everybody else played like garbage. But you're the leader of the team. Right. There should be an accountability. And I can't imagine somebody like Bam doing that, right? Like, it wouldn't. Oh, no. You know, and, and, and that's the part with like that, that kind of just irks me with Joel Embiid. Yeah, a lot of it feels manufactured. Like, I mean, we've talked about it before, you know, it's the need to have these perceived slights in order to kind of fuel you mm-hmm. and to drive you. And I think a lot of that, is is what we see with Embiid. Like his his war with the media, as you pointed out, like it has been largely supportive, and yet he continues to feel like he's being beaten on and picked on and stuff like that. And I I, I mean I just think he's I think he's overly sensitive to a degree about what what is being said to him, and he just doesn't know how to fight his way through it in order to put up his best games. You know, he, he just has to say, oh, it's it's always about Jokic or it's always about this, and it's just like, I mean everything is always a problem for him. So I, I, I like that you pointed out and, and kind of tied together the fact that it's not been a winning success or winning recipe in Philadelphia, and he has been that constant. And I think part of it is, yeah, he does not set a good tone. Like, we talked about it with Atlanta. Like, I mean, Trey, why is Trey Young looked at mm-hmm. as a toxic personality on that team and somebody that the Hawks have been willing to turn over and, and kind of rebuild? And there's and, no and, trade market for him, according to the reporting right. around that whole situation. Right. Like, no trade market? The guy averages like 26 and 11 every game there's no trade market right. for that guy he's one of the best pick and roll passers in the league but you're right it's but, a lot of this but somehow joel driven. joel gets the pass at being perhaps a toxic personality because I, mm. I think i think he's friendly enough i think teammates like yeah him enough. yeah he's kind of like i'm saying like he's kind of got this sideshow kind of like circus clown thing where he's kind of like funny <laughs> at times he's like a troll and he's kind of doing these he is hilarious when he when he sort of tapped into that version of his personality but then right. he has this other sort of alter ego that's, oh, like nobody's ever fair to me and woe is me. And and look, I'm okay with perceived slights. Like like Michael Jordan yeah, yeah, sure. Whatever you is, is like the greatest of all time because of it, right? Like it's fine. <laughs> but it's the way you process it and internalize it and then how you spit that out at the end. Right. And if it's just black mom or, or uh, yeah, black mamba kind of stuff, if it's MJ kind of stuff, like, okay, like you can get like a whole brand off of that, right? Sure. You could do the Steph Curry night night thing. Like that's all the perceived slights. Like Steph going off against Clay the other night. Like all of that's just like whatever you got to right. do to get up for tonight. That's fine, man. I have right. no problem. But then when when Embiid kind of goes through that manufacturing process of it and it spits out a product at the very end, it's like, oh, nobody likes me. And you're like, dude, stop. Like nobody has any patience for that. Nobody cares. Nobody. Yeah. There's no sympathy there for it. And. I, I do want to go back to sort of like how it relates to the heat here. So I do think like there is something symb- uh, symbolic about maybe you're probably right. Like the Sixers were probably broken. It just felt like the tires were coming off. Like they were kind of wobbling and then they went through Miami yeah. and all the tires fell off and then the engine yeah. exploded. And, and so it's over. And I can only imagine what Kyle Lowry and Caleb Martin were thinking when they were in that broom closet of a visitor locker room. They're like, oh my God, we were, it was like last year we were in that other locker room. And I'm not saying that that's like the most consistent locker room. Like that's sort of like a fiery, you've got the Eric Spolster, Jimmy Butler personalities and all that kind of stuff. But at least it was with the right intentions, the right personalities, people showing up on time. And they're like, what is going on? And what is this visitor locker room? Why is it so small? And all this stuff. And I, I can't help but think what they were thinking in that moment. Is it, is it psychological warfare? You think that, that, that the visitor's locker room, does it kind of eat it? Oh, 100%. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it's not quite the old Boston Garden with the leaky pipes and the the, the rodents <laughs> running around the walls or anything like that. But it's but, as close to that you're allowed to get to that in in today's NBA without the players' union stepping in, yeah. right? Like that's yeah. as close as you could get. 
So oh, the what's other the thing bare was, minimum? Check. Yeah. Right, yes, yes. The other thing about that locker room, and the reason I bring it up is because Joel Embiid said something really interesting about yeah. Jimmy Butler in the locker room mm-hmm. after that game. That's and true. there was, I, I think a part of this is getting missed here. We'll talk about what, we'll keep talking about what's going wrong in Philadelphia and what Joel Embiid said after that game, after this here on Locked on Heat. Today's episode is brought to you by Chime. At some point or another, we've all hit that point where you realize it was time to make some serious money moves. And if you want to take control of your finances, you can do so by using a Chime checking account with features like there are no maintenance fees, fee-free overdraft of up to $200. Or you can get paid two days early with direct deposit. You can learn more over at Chime dot com nba look it's all have always happened to all of us at one point or another you take out a little bit too much money or you didn't know exactly how much money might have been maybe a, a transaction hit that you weren't expecting or something like that and you get hit with an overdraft fee you go oh man it's 30 bucks 35 bucks that i wish i could get back well guess what you don't have to worry about that with chime they help you make progress with a fee-free overdraft of up to 200 and you get spotted on do- a debit card purchases and cash withdrawals no monthly fees or maintenance fees and they've got over fifty thousand fee-free ATMs around the country. So Chime has spotted members over $30 billion and eligible members get complimentary boosts to temporarily increase a friend's spot me limit. When you give a boost, they can boost you back to temporarily raise your limit. You direct deposit, set up direct deposit with their Chime account. And after a qualifying direct deposit of $200 or more, Chime will notify you to enroll in spot me with an activated debit card chime will spot you up to two hundred dollars when you exceed your balance so make you make your fall finances a little greener by working towards your financial goals with chime open your account in two minutes or less at chime.com slash nba that's chime.com slash nba chime it feels like progress banking services and debit card provided by the bank corp group <laughs> that's, 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 Typing is too small for me. Members, yeah, blah, blah, blah. we'll figure that out at some other time. Anyway, today's episode is also brought to you by Game Time. Game Time's got a new feature called Game Time Picks. It makes getting tickets to see your favorite teams play live even easier. And Game Time Picks filters out all the fluff to show you only the incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. How convenient is that? Let's say you make a last-minute decision. You want to go see a show or catch a game or whatever you're interested in. Maybe it's a comedy show. Well, Game Time's got you covered 100%, and they show you exactly what you're going to pay, and right up front, too, so you never have to worry about any hidden fees coming in. Or they're all in pricing feature. You know exactly what you're going to pay at checkout. They've got their great seat views feature, giving you a panoramic view of wherever you're going to be sitting if it's a venue you're not familiar with. All that and more only at game time. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time picks. Download game time app today and create an account and then use the code locked on NBA and you get $20 off your first purchase. Terms to apply, but just create an account, redeem the code L O C K E D O N N B A and you get $20 off your first purchase. Download game time today. What time is it? It's game time. We'll be right back. Thanks again for making Locked On Heat your first listen every day. The best way to support the show, like and subscribe on YouTube. Follow us on your favorite podcast app. So, David, we heard Joel Embiid call Jimmy Butler the best player in the league the other night. Um, it was kind of weird how he did it. He he was like, you know, Jimmy Butler's a great player, two-way player, whatever. He's probably one of the best players in the league, probably one of the top five players in the league. No, actually, he's the best player in the league. He kind of just like <laughs> yeah. went down that ride. And I'm just like, okay, that's interesting. And the reason I brought that up with the locker room stuff it's because yeah. you and I have been in that visitor locker room. I'm sure mo- most of the people, of all the people listening, probably have never been in that locker room. It's a broom closet, right? Like, it's so small. Nothing in that room is said without somebody else in that room hearing it. Yeah. yeah. And I yeah. don't, I wasn't in the locker room at the time because I walked by, I, we, we finished the heat media stuff. I, walk, I had to go record the podcast with you. So I'm walking away and I walked by that locker room and it was still closed. And you had a bunch of 76 or staffers sort of nervously pacing outside back and forth. And I was like, well, that's weird. And then Tim Reynolds from the Associated Press uh, tweeted, hey, there's a team meeting going on. I was like, yeah, that makes sense. That, may, that The nervous pacing now checks out and why that locker right. room was still closed afterwards and reporters just outside being like, yo, what's going on here? Um, so eventually everybody gets let in. And so I don't know who was in that locker room at, after the meeting. Was Paul George still in that room when Joel Embiid was saying that? Because if he was, that to me is very interesting. Absolutely. Um, and that is a very pointed shot. And so we, hear, we get that. And then Vincent Goodwill from Yahoo Sports on his podcast suggested that Embiid didn't do that by accident. Here's the yeah. sound. I'll tell you something else that I think is sticking in Joel Embiid's craw. He wanted 
the 76ers, with all the changes they made, remember, they went and got Caleb Martin. They went and got Kyle Lowry. That means they went and made deals with players who play for the Miami Heat. He wanted another player from the Miami Heat. He wanted Jimmy Butler. He wanted the 76ers. He told them, go get my guy. And we know at the end of the season where Jimmy Butler sat with the Heat, Pat Riley calling him out and saying he should play more and everything else and didn't get a contract extension. So it felt like there was some level of opening, at least tangentially, to go get Jimmy Butler. I don't think the discussions ice ever truly got serious to a point that you could even say, okay, they're, they're in a deal zone now. Like, this this can happen. But I don't think Joel Embiid has been happy, even though they wound up getting Paul George. He wanted Jimmy Butler back over there. And I think he made that known. And they couldn't make it happen. So I'm not saying he's pouting, but I'm saying that there's a, there's a lot going on there. So, you know, a lot to kind of chew into with that. But um, the overall idea that Embiid wanted Jimmy Butler and, and and wanted Jimmy Butler over Paul George because it was always yeah. it was only ever going to be one of these guys. Right. That to me is interesting and it checks out to me. And 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 like Vincent said, like they were never really in the the deal zone. It was never really like close to happening, but that's because Paul George was a free agent and he was ready to go sign in Philadelphia it seemed pretty early on in this process. But this idea that Embiid went to the front office and said, "I want Jimmy Butler." That to me does check out considering that they had played together and they still have a pretty good relationship. No, I, I agree with that. I think there was a strong friendship. He's always been very complimentary of Jimmy. I, I think Jimmy in the brief time that he was in Philadelphia probably took on a, a mentorship role over a guy like Embiid and kind of provided him some guidance of just kind of showing him, look, this is what you've got to do. This is the work for all the talk about Jimmy Butler as a locker room cancer and everything else like that. I mean, we're seeing years later, it's been five years and Embiid still talks about him. You know, that it's mm -hmm. a, that's pretty unusual to see a, a former teammate and again with such a brief amount of time that they played yeah, together a couple months be so, yeah. yeah be so complimentary of a former teammate like that so but I just kind of to me I, I don't doubt any of what goodwill reported there I think that he a hundred percent preferred Jimmy Butler but this kind of just go back to what we were saying in the first segment like who who does this as the team's leader? Like maybe you would have preferred another option, but you don't go out there and throw the guy that is on the roster and is getting paid and can't be traded away anytime soon. You don't throw him under the bus and be like, oh yeah, I would have preferred if we had gotten the other guy instead of this one to my right. It's like, what are you doing? Like, how are you not taking ownership of what the team is supposed to be doing and working towards this season? Like he's already thrown out the Nick Nurse. You know, maybe that wasn't his choice for the coach either. Who knows? But he's already saying, I don't understand what we're doing out there. And then he's saying that yeah, Paul George wasn't the guy I wanted. Like, how is that you being the leader of this team as inarguably the best player on that roster? And how is that taking accountability for your team's lack of it's, success? Well, it's not, right? <laughs> it, is, it is not. And I don't think – and that's the part that I, I think that when when uh, Vince is talking about Joel Embiid here, it's – there is – something going on I, I and yeah. I, it, maybe it's pouting maybe it's whatever but like I, I think pouting is a fair word like look at what he's doing you know yeah. he's talking like listen to the sound when he's talking about jimmy butler being he doesn't seem happy talking about it he doesn't even seem complimentary right. he it's more like and he's not on our team was the part unsaid right. and and he seems upset he's pouting yeah. about it and and yeah. all of this stuff and the way that he's acting with the media and all and, and kind of taking out his frustrations with them and some of it rightfully so and some of it not like you know some of the media in philadelphia hasn't exactly been fair to joel and b and i think that's okay when you guys start sure. shoving matches and stuff but that's yeah, upon yeah. you to be a leader to and, and to just basically like as as maybe cold as it sounds just sort of eat it and and, and just be like yeah i had 30 tonight and we lost eat it yeah, this this column was completely unfair and, and went out of bounds, dude. Eat it. Like it it, it doesn't make it right, but it, it, like doing the hard stuff is what makes you a leader. And he just clearly doesn't do that. And people wondering and speculating about Joel Embiid's future in Philadelphia. Hmm. This is where that comes from, yeah. right? Is because he's clearly unhappy there. And what happens when stars are unhappy? They try to find you know, greener pastures. They, they try to find yeah. something else. And and it feels like that might be the road we're going down here. And if Embiid did go to the front office and said, I want Jimmy Butler, and the front office said, we're going to get Paul George because Jimmy Butler is going to cost us draft picks and salary and all this stuff. Sure. No, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to go get Paul George because that's not going to cost us any draft picks. Right. And Joel Embiid I, says, I will... that's cool. I don't care about these draft picks. I want Jimmy Butler. 
And Philadelphia did, and probably did, and Daryl Morey's like, no, we're not doing the thing that costs us draft picks. We're going to do Paul George. Like, I could see where both sides are coming from, but then why Embiid would be like, you didn't get my guy. Instead, you got this schmuck with a podcast instead. Well, I, I look, I, I can understand Maury in the front office's perspective. Like, I mean, sure. it, it, going all like George, as you said, maybe it's looking bad now in retrospect, but there were good moments even as recently as last season, and he's a fine player and everything else. Like, that's he had a better year than Jimmy Butler player. did. He had a better year Absolutely. than Jimmy Butler last year. Yeah, so you would you could make the argument that he was the better choice overall, not only because it wouldn't sure. cost you all the other things on the side, but just because he was a better player. Uh, having said all that, it's just. I know we kind of stirred the the pot a little bit in talking about Bam at a bio and a potential trade or everything like that. But I just want to reiterate that's I mean, we have to explore that possibility given Bam's struggles and what Embiid is going through. In and we're being asked about it every day. I mean, that 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 was a whole segment born out of the yeah. comments section of this YouTube channel. Yeah. I I was just talking to somebody yesterday too, though. It's just amazing how many people are like, you know what? I don't want to have anything to do with Joel Embiid on this roster. And I you get it. What? Like, I mean, yeah. we're talking about this yeah. all. I mean, as much of a, a significantly better player that he is than Bam Adebayo. Like the baggage that he brings is so overwhelming that it just bogs everything down. It kind of detracts away from his ability on the court. You just wish he would cut out all the side quests, which is ironic given that Jimmy Butler is supposedly the one who pursues all these side quests, but he doesn't bring nearly as much baggage as Embiid does on a nightly basis. Yeah, I've got my own issues with Jimmy Butler in terms of his like unavailability, sure, but in in sure. in terms of like this this just like the the pouting in front of the media and everything like that, like that's that stuff. He's really not a does, distraction at the very least. It's exactly, and it's, it's like that stuff resonates across the locker room with Joel Embiid, and I don't know, man. Like to me, you you already mentioned Trey Young. It's like what which one of these uh, expansion franchises could we just put Trey Young and Joel Embiid on, and just let it be like like hey, you Las guys Vegas. just figure it out over there, you know? Yeah. It's just. It, it, if if the Sixers were to explore Joel Embiid trades, he's an amazing player. It feels like crazy to say, like, I don't think the market would be huge for him, but what would the, I don't think the market, there would be a market. He's too good. There would be a market. I don't think that market would reflect the quality of player that he is on the court when he's healthy. And, and that's because of all the kind of stuff that we're talking about here. And, and by the way, I don't, I don't think Miami, asset, right? he's a distressed asset. And maybe that's the time to go get him, right? That's Miami has done. They did that with Jimmy Butler. Yeah. They have yeah. done this, but I, I, I don't know. Like, there's just kind of there's so much to kind of get into there. Um, we're gonna move on though. The NBA is making more changes to the All Star game. We'll tell you what they are and the big mistake the league already made. We'll do that after this here on Locked On Heat. Today's episode is brought to you by Robin Hood Gold with Robin Hood Gold. You don't need a silver spoon to eat up the financial favors of the 1%. Robinhood Gold allows others to get the rates and perks usually reserved for the high society. Now the resourceful individual with Robinhood Gold can earn the very liberal rate of 4.25% on uninvested cash and be rewarded with a handsome 3% retirement boost on IRA account contributions. Robinhood Gold provides the privileges of high net worth for any net worth. These generous benefits are now available for only $5 a month. The new gold standard is here with Robinhood Gold. Sign up at Robinhood.com slash gold. That's Robinhood.com slash gold. Terms to apply for uh, product-specific disclosures, visit Robinhood.com slash gold. Investing involves risk. Rates may change, and gold membership is offered by Robinhood Gold LLC. We'll be right back. Robinhood, official jersey patch partner of the Miami Heat. It's a nice little tie-in for Robinhood here, right? Local here podcast and... Mm. And the local team. Those are good rates, by the way. Um, mm. We're going to start with some news here. Tay Rozier. He's going to be back for Sunday's game. Took that Monday night off to, to kind of rehab that foot injury that had been bothering him. He did say that it had been bothering him for a few games now. Did not use that long. as an excuse for his right. uh, poor play. Um, but that's how you do it, Joel Embiid. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's going to be back against uh, the Mavericks on Sunday. Jaime Hakas Jr. is still expected to be out uh, with that ankle sprain. Luka Doncic, big news here, not going to play in that game either because of an injury. He's going to be, he's rolled out in Dallas for a week, so he's going to miss four games for the Mavericks. But what do you expect out of uh, Heat Mavs on Sunday, David? Uh, well, I'm hoping for a Heat win. I think it's going to be interesting. I'm, you know, we brought up Rozier. Does he come off the bench? Is Spo mm -hmm. going to finally pull the trigger on that? Because I, I think they found something positive with the starting lineup in Monday's win against Philadelphia. Can they Care continue to, make a to duplicate guess? that? I would say Rozier comes off the bench. 
that I, I agree. Think, absolutely. I, I think he, I think you were at that right point. He said, you know what? We want to monitor. We don't want to aggravate the situation. He kind of mm. used the injury as a, yeah. a bit of an excuse there. It's, it's smart. He's done that in the past. And I think that would work out. He did this uh, last it, it, year with Tyler. If we remember where yeah, Hero, it was yeah, after came Tyler came back from the leg extension, he missed a, a game or two with something else comes back. Duncan Robinson had gone back into that starting lineup. And Tyler Hero was going to come off the bench. Remember, there was that six right. starter talk and all that kind of stuff. And right, then right. Duncan Robinson's back at, acted up, and then he got sidelined. And then Tyler Hero right. was thrust back into the starting unit. Right. Uh, and so Eric Spol the point is Eric Spolster has used prior injury to make changes to the starting lineup as an excuse before. And I think I, I could see Spo and trying to guess Spo's rotations is a fool's errand. Like, good luck. But <laughs> yeah. um, I could see Spo going to Terry and be like, we got a good look at this. That lineup was plus 12 against Philadelphia. We blew the doors off of them, specifically in that second half. I want to give this a little bit more of a look. And by the way, for the record, Terry Rozier, I don't think he'll have a problem with it. Every indication I've gotten from Terry since he got here in January, professional, will do what he's told, yep. will do what's asked yep. of him. He is not one of these guys that's going to cause an issue, from what I understand. So um, I do expect and, that. And I, I like also, that matchup. Yeah, I mean, I, him coming off the bench and being guarded by what Spencer Dinwiddie, like that's Spencer Dinwiddie, that favorite for uh, Hardy, yeah, yeah, guys like that. Yep. Yeah, uh, Who yeah. Who picks up Kyrie Irving as a starter? Grimes will probably start in. Grimes has been starting when Luca's been out, so it'll be Grimes and Kyrie in that backcourt. Right. So who picks up? Like you can Marshall put Hero and, on and, and Washington. You put Haywood. You put Haywood on. You got to uh, put Haywood on. Kyrie. You got to put Haywood on Kyrie, and then you could put. Oh, Clay Thompson will start for them. So maybe you yeah. have Duncan chase Clay around. Tyler kind of hides on Grimes, and then you know everything Jimmy? else is chalk. Yeah, Jimmy on yeah. PJ Washington, and and then Bam Ooh. on Gafford. Um, PJ Washington has been on a little bit of a tear here, so that's something worth monitoring. I think this is going to be a three point shootout because I think with with Dallas's size on the court for forty eight minutes between Gafford and Lively, they're just taking away stuff at the basket. That's Jason Kidd's defensive strategy. The Heat don't do a particularly good job of getting to the basket anyway. So I think they're yeah. going to end up taking a ton of threes in this game. Yeah. And then yeah. for Dallas, without Luka, that's their main guy who gets to the rim and creates threes for others. Like Kyrie get, gets to the rim sometimes, but he kind of falls in love with that mid-range jumper. He's not he's not always creating for others the way that Luka is, certainly. So I could see them just leaning into the three-point shot, too. So we can get, like, I don't know, like 80, 90 combined threes between the two teams in this game. It'll be fun for a Sunday. It could, um, could be interesting, yeah, Miami. Typically... Not the that's not their style of play. They like they like well, this year. It is they're right. taking forty three pointers a game I, now. But you're right. You're right. Um, it's not going to look like the All Star game. I don't think it'll look like that. Uh, that's my attempt at a segue here. So, did you Very see nice. this uh, report about the changes to the All Star game? Uh, four teams of eight with a semifinal round. The winner of those two games advances to an All Star game finals. So they want it to feel like. You're out on the park and you're playing pickup and, and you're doing like King Court a little bit, King's Court here a little bit. Um, a few problems with this, although I don't look. I'll, I'll say this right. Four off the teams bat. of eight, though. So are they getting more all stars? So the idea is four teams of eight, but maybe one of them is the rising stars uh, team, or or the rising stars team might be incorporated in this a little bit. It, the the details are still a little um, hazy. Hazy, yeah. And so maybe it's four teams of eight, maybe it's four teams of six, but you can't. Can you do four teams? If you do four teams of five, that makes a lot more sense to me, right? Because then well, you don't have like then then you have five guys on the court and they're just playing. Like you don't want subs in these games. That's lame. <laughs> it's a pickup game. You don't have subs in it. Have you ever played pickup and you have to have like substitutions? You have like six guys, six guys, and you're like, all right, one of us is just going to rotate. Like that sucks. No, it's the worst. Yeah. You yeah, know, if somebody and, gets hurt. I mean, the game ends basically. Yeah, it's right. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. Or, or somebody so, who's waiting. Whoever got next gets in there. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, you know, really whoever's happened. got next, you just wait for four other dudes to show up, and then you start playing again. And then you're like, all right, you guys are on my team. So obviously, you can't do that because it's an all star game. So I, I don't really <laughs> the, the details again hazy. I don't know really. I, I just hope that they don't have substitutions. And so the first round of games, the semifinal rounds, go up to forty points. The final goes to twenty five points. So I could see them talking themselves into, well, it's a game up to forty, so we probably can't have subs. And it's like nobody wants to see that. Like nobody wants to see yeah. that. Um, so you've got that whole thing, the coaching staff, which doesn't really matter in the all-star game, never really has, but you only have two coaching staffs. You have the number one seed in both conferences. So I guess the coaching staff will be split up. So you'll have like the head coaches coaching one and like the associate head coaches. So whatever, I, I just get rid of the coaching staff. Like the coaches never want to go to the all-star game. Don't make them. 
Yeah. No. I don't know why the NBA continues to do this. Don't do that. They don't need a coach. Uh, it, like everybody always uses it as fodder. Like afterwards, like oh, he's not playing his guys, or he's playing his rival team, a uh, superstar, way too many minutes, right. etc. Like I mean, somebody has ridiculous. to be in charge of the substitutions. Is the only reason why there's a coach in the All Star game is the only reason. They but make that like if a you're fan doing, thing. but if you're doing this like five, a fan thing, right? Yeah, like have be four good. fans become the head coaches of these, uh, or somebody in the celeb event. games. It's like, yeah, here's Pharrell. He's the head coach now. It's like, okay, cool. <laughs> um, so yeah, and if one of these teams is the Rising Stars team, like that's like they're gonna lose. They and, like, that, the celebrity that, game? Who gets the bye week? Basically, it's like that's not fair. Do they still get the celebrity game at All Star? Yeah, there's a celebrity game. You want to put them in this? I, I know I do not. Justin I don't Bieber know what can who? <laughs> It's a little dated reference, but yeah, I think. Uh, Bieber? Is that dated isn't now? It? Oh, isn't no. it? It's, it's I, been I, like I, a I, decade I would, plus. Oh no! That she was in, a, in an All Star game, but I might be wrong. But uh, Haley yeah, no, taking shots at the game recently. I don't know if you want to talk about yeah, that. The All Star game, uh, the, the, sorry, the celebrity game at the All Star event always feels like, and this is like an event overall where there are a bunch of different things happening and everything else, and yet the, the celebrity game is by far the worst thing to happen. <laughs> It is. Um, nobody it's actually awkward, watches it. Didn't they have um, Bad Bunny in there a couple of years ago too? Before he became Bad Bunny? Yeah, I think it was like right on the cusp of like him blowing up. Right, it was like right yeah. in that moment, that sweet spot. They got the pocket. But um, <laughs> look, I in general of like making changes to the All Star Game, I'm okay with it. I know a lot of people are like, oh, like you just keep making changes. You're trying to fix it. And the Elon Manning was fine. The Elon Manning was fine. And I'm, but I'm, I'm, I'm okay with them. Like, here's my thing: if you're never going to be consistent with what the All Star Game is then be consistent in it being inconsistent. Just change it every year. And then we have something to look forward to. Like, what are they going to do this year for the All-Star game? Like, just, I'm okay with that. Just make it different every single season. Like, this year, it's played on a slip and slide. And you're like, cool, that's weird. But whatever. Like, just, it. Oh, like, uh, they should have those, like, sumo uh, inflatable suits. <laughs> yes, yes, you got to play in these now. Yeah. Unless you're Joel Embiid, and you can just come up, you just come as yourself. <sighs> That was Rough. an unnecessary take. I was, I was trying to I tie like it all together. <laughs> Thanks for making Lockdown Heat your first listen every day. Like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube. Follow us on your favorite podcast app.